big are the ears? Uh, how, how bushy is the tail? How long is the tail? So sometimes we can set those attributes. So we can say things like Fido dot tail equals bushy. Assigning attributes here. We may go through and do a bunch of these, but essentially at this point we had this amorphous dog here that we didn't define any particular size to it, right? So we've got a dog, we could even get really sneaky though. We could make another class and we wanted to get particular, you know, and we could define maybe a subclass of dogs here, you know, like my mother in law's dog, she has a toy poodle. Alright, so we could call it a toy class, right? So we have the toy dog over here, which is another class. Very specific, maybe it says they're under, you know, two feet tall or something, I don't know, whatever. They're under, I don't know what size toy is, but whatever, you know. Under a foot, I don't know. this dog's literally small, half the size of the cat. There's a dog there. There you go. So the toy dog class inherits from the dog class. So if I instantiate a dog, a toy dog now, so I say set Fido as, and instead of saying dog, I say toy dog. What am I getting here? I'm getting all the methods and attributes that have been set here, along with any methods and attributes that have been set up here. It's a subclass. Right? It's a subclass. There you go. Exactly. So that's all .NET is. It's a big giant framework of classes, and you can pick and choose what you want. We have classes for like a web page. We have classes for a even the printer has its own class for data. We have everything has its own class that all breaks off of what's the main class? System. Uh -huh. That's it, system.web.ui. There you go. So they start with system, done. All right, so once we get all this stuff and we just fill in, so now maybe Toy Dog could even do something else. You can either inherit or you can override. All right, see, so this particular maybe Toy Dog inherits tail, but overrides height, right? Yeah, see, so in other words, maybe here we didn't define any height, and here it's very specific. Or maybe we add even, you know, working dog, what they do. But the point is, why does all this matter here, so bushy? Why does all this matter for our security course in here? Because all they want you to do is be familiar with the idea that where does that initial problem develop then? If all my code does is keep bringing objects into instantiation, defining the class is where I introduce the vulnerability. If, if this is not well written, you know, if the instructions are make a demon dog, and well, I'm going to get a demon, demon dog, dog out of this. Yes. That's all there is to it. All right, see if I make some mistake in there and leave that in there. So this is where the, the most important, so those class frameworks, or I can borrow somebody's. Somebody else out there has written a working dog class. And I think, well, working dog, can't I just use that instead? Sometimes you'll hear this term. In the Windows world, dynamic link, link library. library. All it is is a series of classes available for me to pull up. And I buy, I, I literally, you can buy somebody's DLL and use it in yours. So like in web design, we'll go buy, like maybe if we want a fancy calendar on our page, so we'll buy somebody else's DLL. SharePoint will get modules that we can put in there for calendars or for project management and all that. And it's somebody else's code. Now what have I done? Well, yeah, I've gotten great features, but possibly, their own vulnerabilities. Their own whatever vulnerabilities they had. And you'll hear, no, DLLs never get an update, do they? You see? You know, we never have to update those. They never have their own vulnerabilities or perhaps can get inject virus injection with this. No, never ever. So, I mean, that's essentially what, what they're getting to eventually is that since this whole model is based on reuse, using somebody else's code, once I've got the dog class, how many times do I have to write a dog class? How many times? Once. Once. That's the idea. How many times can I use a dog? I mean, one. That's the idea behind this whole object-oriented thing. So yeah, it's great. The advantage is I could go use somebody else's, and that's really what we do. That's all .NET and Java. What the frameworks are. There's somebody else, Sun or Microsoft, built all these classes that do cool things for me. I even have like fancy ones for interface design, like Swing. Swing is just, you know, they built some interface classes for me that do all kinds of fancy graphics stuff for me. Ooh, she has eaten this. You know? <laughs> or, you know, so that, that's it. That's what they've done. So the vulnerability comes in, especially if I don't know what's in them because we have another term. In your book, they use the term encapsulization. 
Once I create an object, who can see inside that object? Well, the editing class. Yeah, when I, right. Only if the editing class, the class I could go and edit that, but once Fido is created, no one can see inside of Fido. We don't do vivisection on Fido. We don't cut him open to see what's going on. He, we only can work with him by interacting externally. All right, we follow his methods. His method might, he has the sit method, but to use the sit method, I have to use the command method. My, I'm the trainer object here. So I'll say sit, I pass that message to him. He gets the sit, he interprets the sit and uses his sit method and plops the butt down, okay? So that's it. I can't like come oh. over, in, at least in the code world, and figure out like how to actually move his muscles to make him do it. It's encapsulated, it's, it's enclosed. It's, it lives in memory and, and at that point, and then once it's done, what happens to Fido? Unfortunately, when I'm finished with using Fido for my purposes. It goes to the farm. So it goes to the farm, for, yeah. yeah. It, that's where, at least where my mom told me it went. Um, yeah, he, he asked, it gets, when we use a term in the development world, what do we call it instead of just going to the farm? It's even sadder, they call it garbage collection. <laughs> Fido's just garbage now, really? All right, exactly. So they take they take whatever memory he was residing in. Because realize that's all that we're doing here. When we're doing this, we're just instantiating you into memory. Because that's the only place we can really work. All right, and then once we're done, we'll clean you up. So there's another vulnerability. The vulnerability is Java does what when it comes to garbage collection? It automatically does that. It's automatic. In other words, the application layer is supposed to take care of that for you. .NET, does it do garbage collection? Yes, it does. Does it do it well? Not so much. There's a there's a quite one of the vulnerabilities with .NET is that .NET tends to take a long time and will sometimes even forget about a an object that still resides in memory. Why is that dangerous? How do you talk to an object? You just make a call to it. So if I know the object still exists in memory, can I manipulate it? Can I touch it? Sure. As a, a, a hacker or programmer, sure. What if that object was your bank account? <laughs> Let's have some fun. So that's what we take. So that we, we we use the other term. We use remnants. We talked about data remnants way back in the beginning of this whole mess. That's it. It's stuck in memory still, and somebody didn't clean it up. So that's the other vulnerability that will come up. All right. That's the kind of questions you'll get on the exam. Will be targeted towards that idea. What's the problem with this? I mean, why, what what could possibly go wrong? Nothing could go wrong. It's just like the Titanic. Um, nothing could go wrong with this, right? There's no versioning issues, there's no borrowing somebody else's code, there's no uh, objects being, object reuse is the term here. It, object reuse is a tough one because it has both a good and a bad definition. The good definition is yes, I can use their working dog class. I could object reuse, I could use theirs. The bad definition is if I don't clean it up, somebody who I didn't intend to reuse it could reuse it. All right, so realize that, the, read the question closely when we're talking about that kind of exam. Anyway, so we talked about, uh, last but not least, we might even have um, this term polymorphism. What's that? Well, basically, let's say, um, again, you have, I have a Fido, I also, what do I get back? Do I get the three exact same barks? No, I get all three completely different barks. One little, that you can't even call it a bark, it's more of a yip. All right, so I get a yip, a, a bark, <laughs> right, on the end. All right, that's called polymorphism. In other words, that I can send the same command to different objects and get a different response. Well, duh. All right, so it kind of makes sense here. Um, so the inverse of that, okay, is that one of the things, again, that neither she nor Peter mentioned is the idea, I hinted at it, is the idea of overloading. I can also give a dog, if I have an object, I can give it multiple ways to perform its method. So instead of saying speak, maybe I could say talk. Maybe I could say sing. And that gives them so multiple ways to get them to respond back using their same method. They're still going to use the speak method, but I've overloaded which arguments it is looking for. All right, so just understand the term. What's the different dangerous thing with that? Well, what could be a security issue with that? With overloading? 